So I'm out foraging again today. And what we have here is another edible. In the spring, summer, and fall, edibles are, are it's like a grocery store out here. Come winter, they're few and far between. So this is hop hornbeam or ironwood. And these seed pods, I'm gonna come up closer and try to demonstrate. These seed pods uh, have a tiny little seed inside it looks like it looks like a little almond, and it's about the size of a sunflower seed. Pretty tiny, but there are things darn good to eat. And you can dry roast them as well. But aside from having a little bit of protein in them, they also have a little bit of fat. So that's a hard edible to find in the winter. So I'm gonna spend an hour or so and try to get as many of these as, as I can. And, Tonight by the fire, I will uh, shell them out, and uh, it might be the only thing on the menu for supper. So I'm going to put out a few snares for rabbits, but um, not overly optimistic. The snow's not deep enough. Once the snow gets deep, you can really see where they're traveling, but I do have tracks here. They're going both directions. Not too many, but at least I know they're traveling uh, to and fro here. So the idea, I'm trying to snare snowshoe hare. So the idea is to make the, the loop about the size of one's fist or the size of a softball. And then we want that about the same, a fifth size above the ground. So it's pretty easy, a pretty easy set. We'll come down the boat, about there. It's about perfect. So again, if we had deep snow, what I'd do is I'd break off sticks and I'd stick them into the snow and try to funnel them in from each direction into that area um, when they're traveling so they don't sort of go by it, but we don't have much snow here. <laughs> should do. That's about perfect. All right, we're going to put out a few of these tonight and uh, see if we can get us some breakfast because uh, the belly's getting awful hungry. Okay, so here we've got chaga, which is uh, going to be one of my teas. So um, I only harvested a little bit. I've been at this tree before some years ago and taken some off. So um, yes, yeah, it's, it's starting to grow back. We have left this bit alone. And if you do that, it'll actually regrow this fungi. Anyway, it's a tree fungus. It only grows on birch and yellow birch, uh, white birch and yellow birch. And uh, it makes a wonderful tea. Uh, reportedly, they have a lot of medicinal qualities. You know, it will be that'll be in our taste test. So there are three trees that are have great bark for fire starting. White birch, obviously, 
but juniper and not the ground juniper, but the actual tree juniper. Some call it red cedar, but it's, it's actually in the juniper family and there's wild grape. And the other two are resinous, but I'm not sure what's in the wild grape. But yeah, if it's dried and you put that in your tinder bag, um, you got a really good fire starter. So since I started this uh, this uh, adventure here, I've had really changing weather. So I've had low pressure and then a beautiful day yesterday, high pressure. Um, and now it's really low pressure. So it was cold last night, but this morning I could feel it warming up by the minute. In fact, I would suspect it's over, over freezing now and it's really overcast and it's heavy clouds. So I'm thinking we're getting rain. So I made the decision, I'm gonna do my second renovation in, in the fifth day or whatever it is, fourth, fifth day, I forget, of my, of my hot hair. So my tarp's longer this way than it is that way. I'm gonna take it off, I'm gonna shorten the whole thing up. So I'm gonna put the tarp 90 degrees, that'll cover up more of the cracks. I'm gonna move my sh primitive shelter I've got at the end that I normally use for trekking, and it's gonna come in somewhere around here. I'm gonna leave the logs up. Anyway, it's gonna be a vast improvement, and if that rain does come, I'm gonna have some protection, because right now it, it's gonna be kind of leaky in there. All right, better get started. smoky here. <laughs> Thank you. 
Well, I've reduced my uh, my hut here by about a third its footprint, but I'm pretty much convinced. My old bones tell me when the rain's coming and rain's coming. Can't believe it. I, winter was here and my favorite season of the year, and now this is gonna happen. Anyway, I'm pretty sure this isn't gonna leak and I've got a lot of the draft stopped. I'm gonna stop a few more and I gotta get cut in firewood because another night's coming. Not much daylight. So the nights can be, uh, they can be cold and they can be long. And uh, in an effort to occupy my mind so I don't go to sleep too early. Um, because if I do, I wake up in the wee hours of the morning and I have to wait countless hours until it's it's light enough to uh, to get out and about. And uh, so I thought I would uh, show you pretty much the, the kit that I carry for the most part, this is it. Um, the blanket bedroll and what have you are extras and the shelter, but this is sort of the kit I carry when I'm out and about doing living history. And the musket that I've carried for a number of years, um, I was sitting on a deer hunting watch a number of years ago and pulled out my neck knife there and I carved uh, Jenny into it. I finally gave it a name and Jenny was my mother's name. Uh, she passed away in her 95th year, God rest her soul. So she fed me for the first 18 years of my life. And, and well, I built this, this old girl here and she's, uh, yeah, well, Jenny's still feeding me. So I've got a pair of moccasins uh, drying up here above the fire and our ancestors, our early ancestors in the frontier quickly adopted the moccasin as their footwear. Um, some wore the regular moccasin that we think of um, in terms of the native moccasin, but they they also sort of designed one that's sort of a compromise between a moccasin and a shoe. So it, they were called a shoe pack. So basically they had a sole. These these have double leather sole and in between the two leather soles, I sew a piece of birch bark. It does help a little bit with waterproofing um, or water resistance, if you would. And uh, yeah, basically it's a center seam moccasin so, sewed into a sole. So they're about four years old, getting a bit tired. I'm gonna be building a new pair when I get back home from my trek here. And I use a baseball stitch on the center seam. It's a really strong stitch and it gives a nice little puckered look to the thing, although you can hardly tell they're so old. And uh, actually the baseball stitch was a native stitch. Uh, we call it the baseball stitch now, I'm not sure what they called it, but it certainly wasn't a European invention. Anyway, these old girls are tired, but they're gonna be nice and dry for my feet in the morning. Man, do we have the coyotes outside of my shebang tonight? And they are rather close. <laughs> anyway, not too concerned. I got full charge and Jenny there. Hmm. It can't be from my cooking because I don't have a whole lot of food. I don't think they're after my wild grapes and and apples and such. Ghost apples. I have absolutely no idea what time it is. Somewhere in the middle of the night. And it's lagging the inside of a cat in here. But I called the weather. It's, it's been raining for a while and it's raining pretty hard. But so far so good with the new renovation of the hut. I'm still dry as a bone in here. Okay, this is getting rather intense. That wind is just crazy right now. And I built 
built my hut here on four live trees, so there's a, a subtle but a noticeable movement to it. Anyway, I hope I've got it battened down. Okay, that was one intimidating night. So uh, I don't know what the winds were, wind speeds, but they were sustained and they were intense. I, I would say 60 miles an hour uh, for hour, literally hours. And uh, yeah, everything, everything stood up. <laughs> but I was, so I have this one dead elm tree right behind the top. And I knew that one of my corner trees had stopped the whole thing from sort of catastrophic failure at the bottom, but I thought, if one of those limbs breaks off and comes down through the through my hut, it might not be pretty this morning. Anyway, it's, it, it weathered it, and I'm pretty pleased with that. I'm just going to go check my chimney now and see how it, it fared. So even my chimney st stood up to, to the test, and uh, I'm not sure why, because it's uh, it's sort of sketchy. I sort of built it together with shims and such, and like I mentioned earlier, in an ideal world, I would have had time to sort of chink those, all the cracks where you can see the smoke has come out. But in terms of function, the thing worked really well. So down where my foot is, is my firebox. And it, the opening, or the throat, if you would, is about 18 inches square. And I decided that in order to make this work, because it's so short, that I'd give it a really rapid taper. So you can't see it so much here, but on the inside, I tapered it down really quick until I got to the top, and it's only about... It's a, I got an opening about that big. And the last thing I did was put a f nice flat rock to point it away from the, from the hut, which kept a lot of sparks from coming under my tarp. And it, it gave it that Ventura effect. And man, that sucker drew as good as any fireplace I've ever seen. And if I, if I did actually get to chinking it with clay, it would be quite, quite good. Anyway, this is a temporary thing at best, and uh, it'll soon be coming down, but it ser served me well. So I haven't bothered with a fire this morning because uh, I wanted to check the damage and uh, I need to go find some food for breakfast. So I'm going to go see if I can round something up and uh, uh, take the gun along, do a little hunting en route, but I got some uh, more wild edibles in mind for breakfast. Okay, what we have here is, is uh, white pine. And um, when Europeans, it's not just a survival food for the natives, when Europeans first arrived, they found acres of trees denuded of bark, particularly white pine, although you can use any pine that grows in North America. Also the inner bark of slippery elm, white birch, uh, it's really bland, not that good. Yellow birch is great, uh, tamarack, uh, balsam fir. So those are the few of the bark. So it does wound the tree. However, if you take small bits per tree in a survival situation, you're going to take as much as you can get. But I'm going to take a small piece here um, just to give me some calories tonight. So it's very rich in calories, five to 600 calories per pound. Um, but it's, it's full of fiber. Uh, it's full of digestible starches. Uh, so the starches give you that full feeling. It's got all kinds of nutrients. And if we take the needles uh, of the pine, which I'm going to do a little later today when I do my tea tasting uh, runoff, um, it, has liter it literally has five times, one cup of it has five times the daily required amount of vitamin C. So uh, yeah, we'll be making a little tea from this guy as well, but let's see if we can get some inner bark off here.
So what we're looking for here is the, is the cambium layer of the tree. So underneath the cork cambium or the bark, we got the cambium growth layer. So we're only going to take this smaller wound. It'll give me a bit of starch and give me that full feeling for tonight. Maybe let me get through another night. So if I don't have any success hunting. Anyway, you can chew it raw. Um, not that palatable, tastes like sawdust. Um, you can chew it. If you can swallow the, the actual pulp, it's good because it's full of fiber. Uh, there's numerous ways of cooking it. So you can take strips like that. And if you've got some oil, which I don't, um, you can put that in a pan, fry it in a little bit of oil and salt. And basically you've got, uh, uh, you can call it bacon, I guess, for lack of a, a better description. Uh, or if you've got, like if you do have salt, you can cut them into little chips. It's sort of like, um, like a salty chip almost. And you flip them over, brown them on both sides, and, and it's, uh, you're not losing any of the food goodness. And it does make it more palatable than chewing raw. But in an emergency situation, just chew it. If you can't get the pulp down, you can spit it out after you've got the nutrients out of it. So we're going to harvest a little bit here for tonight's supper. So another way one can cook this, if you, this will rip into nice small little strips and you can boil that up, sort of like an inner bark spaghetti, if you would. Uh, and that'll help you get down the fiber because chewing it raw, it's hard. You can, if you cut it in little pieces, you can, you can swallow it and, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does make it more palatable, palatable. If I were to um, take this and, and go all the way around and remove the, uh, the cambium, uh, I would, it's called girdling the tree and this tree would be dead, dead next summer, but this, this will compartmentalize it sort of like losing a limb and it'll be fine. And the other thing, aside from the food I've got here, I see here in that strong wind, it's brought down a bunch of, a bunch of the um, needles or small branches. Uh, and pine, white pine, which is m the preference for inner bark, is very easily uh, easy to identify. It's the only pine tree that has uh, five needles in a cluster. So I'm gonna take this for my tea. I've got some food for my supper and uh, getting a bit cold. So I'm gonna go start my fire. I'm gonna do my tea tasting and uh, yeah, then warm up a bit.
so all week I've been um, I've been um, drinking wild edible teas and cedar has been the most common and it's pretty identifiable. Um, but I thought I'd show a few of the things that you can make um, teas from and some of the things that I haven't yet harvested. So these, they look like berries, but they're off of juniper. And uh, basically what they are, they aren't a berry at all. They're called a fleshy cone. So you have cones in any coniferous tree. But So these are a fleshy cone and that's a berry. You don't need a lot of them. Makes a pretty strong, potent tea. Um, it's also been used to um, to flavor gin for decades, centuries, in fact. So as long as they've been making gin, they've been putting those fleshy cones in it. This is the chaga that I, I um, harvested the other day. Uh, it's a tree fungus that grows on yellow and white birch. Probably my favorite, and probably from a medicinal point of view, the best of the lot one can get. This is balsam fir, and this is eastern hemlock. So the needles look the same, they're flat. Uh, the difference being the hemlock's soft and pliable, uh, where the balsam fir um, is quite stiff and picky. But they both have, you can see a distinct, I hope you can see a distinct um, stripes on the back. But these are kind of a real, almost a blue color. And these are just two stripes of, of different green. Anyway, the balsam Fur is a really strong tea, probably my least favorite, but again, they're all good in vitamin C. So that's all you got. That's what you'd make your tea from. Hemlock, it's not the poisonous hemlock. There is a shrub that is poisonous. The only thing you'd have to be careful in identification there is there's a domesticated yew that's planted, but you're not gonna find that in the forest and it's very toxic. So, but uh, hemlock makes a fairly pleasant tea. This is spruce. White spruce are indigenous spruce, and um, it, it was used as well as teas, and it makes a good flavorful tea as well, but it was used for, um, for hundreds of years to make spruce beer as well. And this we harvested this morning, which is the uh, pine tree. It's one of the few pine trees, I think, that's got an edible um, tea on it, although you probably can make it from the others, but I think they're pretty harsh. And again, to identify it, if you pull off a cluster, it'll have exactly five needles in a cluster. So there's a cluster right there. It's got exactly five needles, so pretty identifiable. I'm going to be cooking that up this morning for my beverage, and I'm going to be boiling up the inner bark that I took for my breakfast. So that's covering some. Some that I don't have here that you can experiment is the seed pod heads on sumac, those red cone things. Um, makes sort of a really mild tea, but high in vitamin C. Um, if you've got tree bark, I don't know if I've got a tree tree limb here or not. Some of the hardwoods, here we go, that make good teas, and I can't find one in the area, is yellow birch is probably my favorite wild tea. And there aren't any here, of course. But the way you do is you take green limbs like that, and you use your knife to scrape up down to the, the uh, cambium layer, like we took the pine bark off. And you just scour those guys up like that, leave all those little bits on. And you throw that in a billy of water and boil that up. And um, yellow birch has a taste of, um, best way to describe it would be sort of like spearmint and and uh, quite a pleasant tea. Um, you, you can make tea from any any deciduous tree and it's safe to drink, but almost benign. You can't really get much flavor out of any of them. So yeah, with the exception of yellow birch, it's, it's quite pleasant. Anyway, I'm going to get inside, get warmed up, and I'm going to brew up some pine tea to start with, and then I'm going to cook some of that inner bark. So when I'm making tea, um, you, you, you can put the, the needles or the twigs or whatever you're brewing up in the water and boil it. But what you're doing is you're going to boil away some of the nutrients and certainly some of the vitamin C. So if you get your water boiling in your kettle, nice little boil going, take it off, let the boiling stop, put in, put in whatever needles or twigs you're using and let it steep for about five to ten minutes and then you get the full nutrients out of it. So we're going to bring this guy to a boil and put in those pine needles we harvested this morning. Okay, got rapid boil. Just make a spot here in the ash bed to keep it warm, but not not boiling. Perfect. 
and let those the boiling just subside a little bit there. Maybe still a little too warm there, so let's move her back a little bit more. Maybe. Let's see what white pine tastes like in a few years. As I remember it, it's very mild, um, certainly palatable, but not a lot of flavor to it. What is interesting is the variety of trees that one can, um, teas that one can get from foraging. It's just crazy the different flavors that each one has, but yeah, this is, this is okay. But um, I'm gonna rank them here in a second when I get this down and we'll, uh, I think I could do that right now. So number one and favorite tea of mine is Chaga. And probably from a medicinal point of view, it's more than just a tea. My absolute favorite. Second would be Cedar. Uh, my, my third, if I could have found it, which I wasn't able to make on this trip would be Yellow Birch. Um, winter yellow birch, uh, followed by hemlock, then spruce, uh, juniper, which is quite sharp tasting, uh, and bottom of the line would be balsam fir. Um, it's really harsh um, tasting, full of good stuff, but really harsh tasting. Now I'm going to sip this tea and then I'm going to cook up some stuff. But I, as far as how the, the my week has been out here, um, I'm, I'm quite pleased because foraging for wild edibles in the winter is pretty limited. And I thought I was going to be a lot hungrier, but the, um, the fermented somewhat rotten apples, uh, the ghost apples and the, the grapes, there's abundance of them and uh, utterly blown away with how, how good those uh, ghost apples were. In fact, that's something I would in, in the future uh, seek out and eat at home. It was that good. So they sort of sustained me. Um, augmented by a, a few squirrels that I've got. So it's all been good. But so I've had lots of carbohydrates, had lots of tea. I certainly had enough vitamin C, but I could use some uh, complex carbohydrates and a little more starch. So I'm going to uh, finish my breakfast with some of those apples, cook up the uh, inner bark of the pine I cooked. I'm going to make spaghetti out of it. And then I'm going to go off and search for some cattail roots, which, will, uh, which I'll add to my supper this evening. Inner bark white pine spaghetti. So once I boil this up and eat my inner bark spaghetti, I will um, be drinking the, the remnants and the, the water is going to contain all the nutrients that's going to boil out of the out of the fiber so it keeps me hydrated and uh, I think it's gonna be pretty tasty I wish I had some oil I'd, I'd certainly like to try I never have tried to make um, sort of the bacon or chips a little oil a little salt but two items that I don't have on this trip So I'm making a, uh, a digging stick to go harvest some cattail roots, which uh, are going to give me those carbohydrates and starches I talked about. 
and uh, this is a piece of blue beach at the top, so I'm going to put a little bevel on it, and hopefully it's not too frozen in the marshes that I'm going to be trying to uh, forage this food from. So we'll get a little point on this, and it should work. I'm actually sitting on a tree that came over in that storm last night, not too far from my hut. Okay, don't want it too sharp, but uh, that should work to extract those roots from and Yeah, that will be my supper tonight. So it's, it's been such an overcast week. Uh, kind of abysmal weather, if you would. Changing sort of days. I thought I'd take advantage of this sun. And uh, we're going to try my inner bark, white pine inner bark spaghetti. See how this goes down. A little more palatable than straight off the tree. Maybe the weather helping too, but it's pretty good actually. A bit bland, but it is full of starch so um, and fiber. So it's going to give me a, at least a feeling of being full. But um, actually, I'm not that hungry now. Like I said, couple that with the apples and all the wild raisins I'm finding with the wild grapes. It's been pretty good. So I come upon this uh, huge wetland area and it, it encompasses hundreds and hundreds of acres. And it's aside from the water parts, it's uh, on any spot where there's any soil, it's covered in cattails, uh, literally. And uh, it is a superfood. It's high in carbohydrates, high in calories, high in starch. Uh, it's, it's best tasting in the spring. It's also a crazy popular plant with the natives. They use it for medicinal purposes. Um, the green leaves, you squeeze a jelly out that's a pure antiseptic. In fact, pioneers kept it in their first aid kit, if you would. Um, they use the reeds to uh, weave mats for sleeping platforms, to cover wigwams, to make moccasins, uh, and, and a superfood. In the spring, if one takes the lower stalk, it peels the green back to the white core, tastes exactly like asparagus. Anyway, not quite as palatable in the winter, but it's going to be good food. So I'm going to see if I can dig some out. 